Welcome to Carrying Wayward, a supernatural podcast for fans who aren't ready to let go and newcomers to the series who are ready to jump in. I'm Marie Vigourou. And I'm Drew Shulman. In this episode, we're diving into Supernatural Season 6, Episode 6, You Can't Handle the Truth. Let's get this show on the road. no housekeeping for this episode, but I'm just really excited to know what you thought about it. Let's just get the elephant out of the room real quick with the we kind of get Sam's reveal that like shit's going on. We at least get an acknowledgement from him, which is more than we've had all season so far. We establish this whole no one can lie thing during this curse to Sam can suddenly lie during this curse, which also raised questions because I was like, is he lying or is he being like truthful or just like like lying through a mission maybe? Like, how is he doing this? And then obviously the reveal that he is lying and then the reveal, which was kind of just like, you're right, something's wrong. What's wrong? Oh. So the next episode really picks up exactly where we left off. And, you know, this is uh, one of those things where this – would have, could have been a two-parter. So we don't know what is wrong. We just know that something is wrong, that Sam has known about it, and uh, that Dean wasn't crazy. Dean was right. With all of Sam's lying, could this still be a lie? We don't know. I guess we'll see. We'll see next episode. For now, we don't know. Well, I'm looking forward to next episode already. Well, so do you remember when you said that we would find out what's wrong with Sam in episode six or seven? Really, I just picked a number. Like, there was zero thought. It was just like... No thoughts, just vibes. <laughs> so how about you get us started with the recap? Count me down. Three, two, one, go. We start with this poor girl just being told the brutal truth of everything to the point that she takes her own life. It is really, like, the darkest death I think we've had in a while. Followed by the next darkest death of a dentist killing his patient. Note, I watched this an hour before going to the dentist. Oh, no. And we find out eventually that it looks like someone else who was affected before everybody else started this whole thing by summoning a goddess who is all about the truth. And the whole thing is that the truth will kill you because it's too much. And Dean accidentally invokes it. And he's all like, haha, I have magic powers. Now I'm going to use them against Sam. But first I'll test it on Bobby. And that's a whole bucket of worms I want to talk about later for fun. Uh, but then we get more about Sam, who apparently can lie, and then even Veritas, the god of truth, was like, what the hell? This is crazy. And they do kill her. And then Sam's all like, yeah, there's something wrong with me. The end. All right. I'm going to fill in some blanks with the long game. So this is the second appearance of Biggerson's, which is the chain restaurant that we're going to come back to uh, quite a bit, especially in the next couple of seasons. And uh, the first time that we'd seen it was in Bad Day at Black Rock, if you remember. Uh, we find out that Dean had been praying to Cass to get some help with this Sam situation, but Cass wasn't answering. Dean does end up telling him, like, I've been asking you to be here for days, you dick. Which, if I put that line through, like, my Dean-coded translator, I would get out, like, I needed you and you weren't there, if it was said by a, a normal person or someone who is not Dean Winchester. Yeah, it, there was there was a weird energy there. But again, it was very Cass and Dean kind of there. It doesn't even feel like they're on the rocks. It just feels like they're not like lining up at the right points in their life at the moment. There's a lack of timing there that is uh, like a lack of synchronicity that's um, a little bit a little bit challenging, I think, for their relationship. And we've we've been seeing it, I think, since the beginning of season one. Arguably, probably since like the last episode of season five, but we'll get back to that a little bit later. The moment where Cass refills uh, Dean's whiskey glass was apparently unscripted. So this was basically a total gift from Misha Collins and Jensen Ackles. Oh, that is magical because I really it did stand out as a moment like it felt like a growing moment for Cass specifically to like understand the significance of doing this for somebody. Uh, and the fact that it's something I feel like he wouldn't do except for with Dean. I completely agree. And I also saw it like as a way to kind of address that lack of synchronicity that they're having and to be like, well, I'm still I'm still here, you know, like right now we're having trouble communicating, but like I am still here and I know what you need and I am going to try to provide that to you and like metaphorically refill your glass. It's a long distance relationship. They've gone from being like a regular couple seeing each other 
to like the long distance trouble of like I tried to call you and it was the wrong time zone so you didn't answer but like when I'm here even if I'm here to basically say like I'm sorry I can't I'm still gonna do what I can for you because I love you oh my boys all right we find out that Dean is Bobby's favorite even though he thinks that (laughs) Sam is the better hunter (laughs) this made me so happy We also find out that Bobby loves pedicures and Tori Spelling, and this is all happening while he is drinking a tall glass of cold milk. And this whole thing is just mwah. For those who have listened, we did do an Impala talk about what we think Bobby does to relax. And I forget exactly where it happens, but I think between the two of us, we basically settled on he totally goes for pedicures. We definitely settled on like trashy reality TV kind of things like this. And I think at some point I even suggested like just like the classic, like a slice of pie with a big glass of milk kind of thing was like, like we nailed this. <laughs> well, so remember that I knew this. So Dean and Lisa break up. Yeah. Wow. Um, I'm just going to blanket say we're saving this for the story time because I've got a lot to talk about there. Absolutely. I think that this is also the start of the Dean Winchester is a killer thread. And I think that it's really significant that he comes to this conclusion after his conversation with Lisa. And to be clear, like Lisa never actually said that Dean is a killer, but that's the conclusion that Dean comes to. And this is really important because it's it's really a thread that's going to follow through all the way to season 15. Yeah, it had big... (sighs) Dean hunting vampire vibe. Like... As far as last episode and as far as our first encounters with them uh, and Gordon, this whole the way he hunts being a little too killery has always sort of been there. And if we're not going to focus on it more, I'm frightened. This isn't the first or the last time that Sam is basically called an abomination by a supernatural creature. The first time was by Cass in 99 Problems, and it will happen again. And so here the, 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 the goddess Veritas is telling him that, like, he's not human. He's not human. What are you? What are you? And this is going to happen again. Oh, I like this. As far as the not finding out the answer today and kind of getting me, like, almost cheap out of, like, I admit something's wrong, but we're not going to find out yet. We'll just we can now brush it under the rug a bit more because I'm admitting to it. We don't have to think about it as much. I mean, I know you're okay. So for like, I know you're frustrated about not knowing exactly what's going on. And I totally see that frustration and I want to make room for it. But I promise you that you are going to find out what it is. I don't think I don't really see it as a cheap out because I know what's going to happen next. And I kind of like that they I like the way that this is playing out. So like I, again, want to respect your frustration but I, I really do think that there's a purpose for what they're doing. Okay. And you know what? I can I'll, I can always admit when I'm wrong, when I feel like when a show can do something that makes me upset and then later makes me realize like, oh, that was the right choice. I'm looking forward to being proven wrong. It just feels like this is a way of answering it so they don't have to address it and they can go a few more episodes without touching on it before it becomes an issue again. Maybe we won't know exactly what next episode exactly, exactly, because now they have to find out because Sam doesn't know, right? Yeah. Now the two of them want to know, but it means that they're looking together, which means it doesn't need to be the forefront as much. Our theme this week is cruelty. And uh, before we define the word, I want to say that I hesitated a lot about this theme. I sort of kept going back and forth between truth and cruelty because of like how the episode is structured and what it's about, obviously. Being who I am, I obviously the words of Dr. Taylor Allison Swift came to mind. um, And I quote, so casually cruel in the name of being honest. And I sort of figured, all right, well, why don't we talk about the limits of truth and cruelty and where those two concepts can sometimes meet. Because I think one thing that this episode is trying to make very, very clear is that not all truths should be told because sometimes telling an unnecessary truth is cruel. Given the choices, I'm much happier to have gone with cruelty. I feel like it leaves us with a lot more, a lot less of a leash to run away with, which forces us to focus more. I feel like truth can be too broad and branch out in too many ways, cruelty really makes us focus on the cruelty of being honest. And that's not to say that all honesty or all truth is cruel, but I do think that in this particular, and and truth is very necessary, right? Like, I think we all know that, right? We're not talking about like 
truth in general, but we're really talking about those moments where truth and cruelty intersect, basically. So the word cruelty comes from Latin crudelis, uh, which means rude, unfeeling, and hard-hearted. Why don't you get us started with Dean this week? So I think there's something really funny that kind of like inadvertently starts out the like truth telling of this episode. And that is Bobby's calling out of the trope of Dean, as he puts it, getting dirty while cleaning everyone else's messes. Uh, Because we do have a lot of times where this does happen to them. And I feel like Dean more often than not, where like the issue of the week becomes his issue of the week more when it's like when it's like, you know, like being scared or, you know, like being haunted or something. Uh, But through the episode, we're seeing just how brutal honesty can come across as so cruel. And while we often preach how these two, especially Dean, need to talk about how they feel, it's like the monkey's paw situation for him of Dean wants the truth, but sometimes what we want and what we need differ. We see both sides of it. Sam somehow being able to still lie to him, but more so in Lisa's honesty. And even more specifically in how she does at one point apologize uh, for feeling as though she has come across too harshly or gone too far, especially when talking about Sam, basically telling Dean to never come back. She's so clear about it. And despite the fact that we're clearly under- to understand she's affected by this curse and has to tell the truth, it doesn't feel like she's being forced to say these things. She is being brutally honest out of her own necessity. And I think it's important to understand that while truth can be cruel and sometimes it can be too cruel to tell someone the truth. You need to weigh it out against holding that truth from them versus speaking your truth. Again, because of the, of the way the episode is structured, I'm really going to take the approach of like, okay, she was under the curse because if we look at the rest of the characters and like how the curse affects them, like it basically made them say, the things that they kept hidden from other people. And for some of them, like it's, it's some pretty terrible things, all true, but really awful. And I'm going to take the example of the sisters in the beginning, because I find that this one is probably like the most representative of what's going on with the brothers, um, particularly with Dean and and, and Lisa and, and all that stuff. But like, so the older sister is telling the other, the younger one that the family is just like waiting for her next big breakdown that like her stomach drops every time that the phone rings and her family are basically like her hostages. Like, yeah, she might've thought those things when she's angry or frustrated. And so in, in that respect, they are technically true, but I don't think that she usually thinks those things of her sister because like that would be like me calling my sister out of the blue and telling her, all my worst thoughts of her that I have when I'm like upset with her, right? Like those things are true at the time that I think them, but I don't actually think them most of the time, right? Like the way that I feel about my sister when I'm frustrated with her doesn't represent the way that I feel about her in general. This is where I think the cruelty element really comes in because like it's one thing to tell somebody some awful things like in the heat of the moment when you're angry with them or even like to tell them things because like you need to tell them because it, it, you need to speak your truth and be like you are you know like like you said to speak your truth but to then calmly call somebody up uh that you love and to tell them your literal worst thoughts about them like out of the blue for the sake of quote unquote honesty, like that is cruel. That is cruel. And it's, it's, it's unhinged behavior in, in the worst possible way. So if we sort of come back to Dean and Lisa, I don't think that Lisa would have spoken to Dean the way that she did if Dean hadn't been under the spell or or, uh, under the curse. Sorry. I think it shows us what Lisa's worst thoughts are about Dean, like the ones that she has when she's most angry and most frustrated with him, but it's not representative of how she feels about him overall. So maybe she had decided to break up with him, right? But I don't think that she quite would have done it this way if there hadn't been something supernatural afoot. I, I think in the wider scope of the episode, especially using the previous examples as you mentioned with the, the two sisters, it makes sense. It honestly it makes more sense than my reading of it. But there's still something in the way Lisa seemed 
calm isn't the right word, but she seemed very together and very like purposeful with her words. And while there was a moment where I think this is what I really drew to me is the fact that she makes a comment about Sam and then apologizes for it. But then when speaking about Dean doesn't apologize about it. And yes, again, the dynamics are a huge issue here, but the fact that she's able to realize she's speaking like out of turn when it's about someone else, but then when it's to the person directly and very specifically about how like you nearly killed my son, like, Absolutely. Obviously, like th- that is of the utmost importance. It honestly feels like, yes, maybe it came across harsher or more abrupt because of the curse. And maybe these weren't the darkest thoughts she was thinking. But I think this is truly where her heart was. And there, I- I'm willing to bet you this phone call would have happened close to the same way. Curse or no curse. I disagree with the fact that it would have happened the same way, but I do think that she was going to break up with him. That I completely agree with you. Like for sure. It, and it was necessary, right? Like it's 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 a necessary thing to happen at this point. I also have some thoughts about the fact that Dean took the phone call when he knew what was going to come out of it. If we continue looking at Dean through the lens of cruelty, he is very much the victim because he is the one afflicted with the curse this week. And while he does have to deal with the harsh truth from Lisa, uh, he accepts, which weirdly shows the strength of their relationship in an ironic kind of way that like. And I think actually now that you've said it, it almost kind of puts a, a point that where it's like he almost expected this or like was worried it wouldn't happen without the curse and maybe use this as an excuse to force it to happen. Ooh, that bastard. So moving away from Lisa it's with Sam that we really see him hurt by all these lies more so, I feel. And this actually does turn to physical violence, unfortunately, after getting what is potentially a more truthful but devastating and cruel response from him. I honestly was a little taken aback by Dean's reaction, but given basically looking at the two side by side of Dean receiving the truth and then his reaction to said truth, and one is a very quiet and collected acceptance, and the other is like eight or nine punches straight to the face. Clearly how he was feeling himself and his own truths needed to be spoken. And unfortunately his fist did the talking. Right. So I think that you're touching on something that's really crucial here, not only about like this episode, but about Dean's character overall, because like, yeah, Sam's truth visibly breaks him. Whereas Lisa's truth, I guess that someone who doesn't really get Dean would say that it leaves him like indifferent almost. Uh, It really doesn't, but he does play it cool. Uh, Like he's not hurt by it. And I think that there's a truth about who Dean is in that reaction, that there's nothing that Lisa can tell him that he doesn't already tell himself. Like there's no insult big enough or shameful enough that she can toss at him that he doesn't already think about himself. And and like that's Dean's defense mechanism in a nutshell. And we're going to talk about that more in critical time. But like here's the real kicker here, in my opinion, like knowing what was happening to him, Dean had no obligation to pick up the phone when he saw that she was calling him, that Lisa was calling him, but he did because self-sabotage is his MO. My God, I didn't even read the self-sabotage angle of this whole thing. And now that you've pointed it out, it is so blatantly obvious. Because some things can't be unsaid, right? Like there are some things that are absolutely unforgivable. And I think that, and, and, and I mean, you know, I'm certainly not defending Dean's behavior. I know that he was a vampire in the previous episode. And that's all, you know, like obviously within the framework of the show, like that is quote unquote, possibly excusable, but realistically, like somebody shoves your kid into like a hallway, like you, you just, you sort of want to get that person out of your life, right? Like I'm going to side with Lisa on this one, even though I fully understand what Dean was going through. But again, like given the circumstances, there could have been more talking about it. Right. Because she also knows about the supernatural and all that stuff. But Dean didn't even give himself that chance because he felt like he deserved to be broken up with. I think this is a conversation that could go a lot deeper and I have a lot more thoughts on it. But I think they're going to start breaking away from our subject matter for today. So I'm okay to pass on. Well, I agree 100% there's a lot deeper conversation to be had about the idea of a relationship with a hunter and the expectations of it. And yeah, that's a whole other Whole other episode. Sam. I'm just going to say, I think Sam has been cruel this entire time. Since, like, season six started, everything about him has kind of been 
I think I've used the term like macho or like douchebaggy bro energy, but he's just been cruel. And though I accidentally predicted a few weeks ago, we'd finally learn a bit about what's up with him. It just feels like even in this episode where the idea is that we're going to learn that there is something up and that he is aware of it and he is finally being truthful, which does not require a curse. He is choosing to do so after he has proven that he can fight the curse. It just really left me kind of like baffled with his actions up to this point more so. I found it really hard to find talking points about Sam in this episode because I think that in this particular moment in the story, like in this episode, Sam and his quote unquote condition, whatever that is, they're basically more of a plot point than anything else. And and that and it it's also really hard for me to comment without spilling the metaphorical beans, literally. <laughs> and so I promise you that once we find out, like Sam is gonna become more of a character again and not just a plot line, but like for now, it's really hard. And, and we do have some amazing moments ahead of us in this season in that regard. Like, there are a lot of narrative possibilities that open up because of that. But right now, like, I just cannot comment on this without 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 just, like, spilling it all. And I'm just, I'm so excited to talk about Sam again. <laughs> like, you know what? I have a lot to talk about. I mean, as much as I agree, there's a lot less to talk about this week about Sam. I think I have some salient points I'd like to bring up. But you're right. I think the one positive to this whole kind of like Samlessness we've been having this season, despite his return, is only going to make when he becomes the focal point again more impactful. So I want to kind of look back, as you did, on the um, sister and the phone call from her sister before she took her own life. And that is how, yes, obviously the things that were said were kind of those like darkest moment truths you have, or you just think something terrible that obviously go like, no, never. She clearly felt like frustrated with her sister. Like, even if it wasn't to the point of you should go do this, but just to the point of like, I like, you know, I, to be personal for a second, I think we've all, or at least I hope most people haven't been in a situation where someone is coming to them for help over and over and over and they drain your battery and you just physically can't be there for them anymore without stressing yourself out. But this is like taking, like, you know, in that point, it might be worth telling somebody, hey, I need some time or some space or discussing with them, not telling them to go fuck off. And I feel like the sister here just loses that filter, which is what ultimately the truth is doing. It's forcing that darkest truth. But the reality is, as much as she would have in the moment lied and just been as supportive as possible, even if she might have been at the end of her rope and needing a break, we we tell those white lies or we bend the truth to fit somebody when we know they're in need. All that to say, Sam super doesn't do this. You know, we've seen Sam, the people person up to this point in every other season, be the more, you know, human connective type person when it comes to talking to a victim. And he just blatantly yells at this girl like, oh, you're lying to me. You have a tell. Tell me the truth right now. Like, no, like, again, cruel truth to turn to someone who just lost their sister, who is clearly blaming themselves for it and is just trying to get through the day and have this supposed cop or agent blatantly call them out as a liar and force the truth out of them is so underhanded and dark. I just I think if anything, like the weirdness, the fact that Sam is the one person who doesn't have to be affected by this curse, he is the most cruel truth this episode. Like you've mentioned, like the older sister is on the phone with her younger sister and like she seems really cold and really disconnected. Right. And it's only once the curse wears off that she realizes what she's done and she's starting to feel this like huge, immense guilt and justifiably so. Right. Like. Her, her sister ended up taking her own life as a result of her, of her actions, as a result of her cruelty and her, you know, casual cruelty. Again, thank you, Dr. Taylor Allison Swift for these words. Um, but when she was under the power of the curse, like, it's like she can't feel the feelings of love that she has for her sister in that moment in, or usually, and like leverage those to not tell her those horrible things that she's, 
like she does end up telling her. So if we come back to Sam at the end of the episode, like he keeps repeating that, like he quote unquote, can't feel it. And we're not so sure what that means yet, but we know it can't be good right? Like no matter what it is, it's not good news for our our tallest bean. So my question here would be like, what happens when inevitably, because we still have nine seasons to get through, Sam starts feeling again? That's a horrifying image to conjure for me. Thank you. You're so Uh, welcome. I'm like, you're doing all this. I'm like, oh, I can start theory crafting now. Maybe this is a curse. Maybe Sam's being forced to not feel. And that's the whole thing. And it has to do with being in hell and Lucifer. And then just that bombshell. Thanks. Uh, Yeah, no, Sam, the now self-expressed, unfeeling character that he is, you know, allows himself basically by the nature of not feeling becomes more cruel because as the old adage goes, the truth hurts sometimes. And when you don't have the filters to know when and how truthful to be, it's just easier to go too far, even if it's unintentional. The reason why sometimes we don't tell people like mean, mean truths is because we love them. And again, I'm not saying like lie to the people that you love, right? Like that is not what I'm saying. But in certain cases, you're going to eat the dish even if it's inedible because you love the person who made it for you, right? And I think that these are the kinds of situations that we're talking about. In this moment, like Sam doesn't feel it. He doesn't feel that love for other people. Like he doesn't feel that love for his community that he doesn't feel bad if there's baby stew being made. He doesn't feel bad if Dean becomes a vampire. Like, he doesn't feel it. But what what happens when he starts feeling again? Like, I don't know. I'm just, I'm so, yeah, I'm excited. For, <laughs> I'm so excited. I went from being like, yeah, I'm sure when we get to Sam's, like, revelations, it'll be exciting. I'm not particularly excited for them, but I'm sure I'll be turned around by then. Nope, we fixed that now. I can't wait. Oh, you're so welcome. (laughs) This episode was written by Eric Carmelo, Nicole Snyder, and David Reed, directed by Jan Eliasberg, and originally aired on October 29th, 2010. I feel like I don't recognize any of those names. Am I mistaken? So this is the first episode for Eric Carmelo, but he will be writing in season six and uh, seasons nine through 11. Same for Nicole Snyder. And David Reed gave us Hammer of the Gods. Ooh, okay. So these were his two episodes, actually, for Supernatural. It was Hammer of the Gods and You Can't Handle the Truth, which is really interesting. And so he came up with, uh, with the story. He was a writer and a script coordinator for the series. I must admit, I I do like the writing this episode. I think it was really well put together. I kind of like the, there's lots of key moments to pick out, like when people are being too truthful. Everything that Veritas says, I think are really well written lines. And then Bobby's entire phone call is pure magic. And this is the only episode for Jan Eliasberg in the series as a whole. I'm always so intrigued by those like one-off directors like this. Like it just, it's like, it makes me want to like rewatch the episode sometimes to sort of see like what made it different or what was their style because it's their only one. This one actually has a very interesting uh, directorial style to it. It has an almost like film noir feeling to it, particularly when Dean is in the uh, in the bar. You can see like the there's a really interesting moment photography wise in there where like there's some extreme close ups on his face that really remind me of those film noir from the 40s, uh, which was really interesting. I'll have to rewatch that scene now. I'm intrigued by that. What's in the Hunter's Journal this week? I never wanted this life. Hunting, killing, loneliness. It was never for me. I love making friends, being social, going out, having fun. But this life kind of just... Well, it just pulls you in. Once you know the ugly truth beneath the surface, you can't stop noticing it. Trust me, I tried. I tried for so long. Seeing that thing tear apart my best friend and eat her piece by piece licking its fingers and drooling like it was the best meal it had ever goddamn eaten, all the while periodically looking up at me, watching me cry and scream, almost as if these were just as delicious for it. 
After that and a traumatic couple of years in therapy, I was convinced it was all some kind of nightmare. A fake memory to block out what really happened because it was too terrible. Whatever could have been worse than that thing I made up must have been really sick then. It was almost 20 years later that I was saved by someone in the alley behind the building. They appeared out of nowhere and pushed me aside to fight whoever had been about to mug me. Although seeing the fangs and taking the stranger back to my place for some wound care, I finally put it all together. We traveled a bit together and I learned more and more until I couldn't not see it everywhere. The truth had been revealed. I was one of them and I don't think I could ever stop. Damn do I wish I could. Well, thank you, True. This was horrifying. Your thoughts for this week? Hopefully an uplifting one this time? Oh, uplifting. Absolutely not. I'm coming in hot with a very devastating hot take. I would like to go back to Dean and Cass's like end of season five breakup in Swan Song. Because we talked about it, but I think we need to talk about it a little bit more. So, just to paint you a picture, this is when Cass leaves Dean in the car to go back to heaven because he thinks that it's what Dean would do. And he wants to model his entire life around what would make Dean proud because that's how Cass shows love. Dean obviously doesn't see it that way. Uh, He sees it as like an abandonment, just like we talked about at the time. He sees it as like, Cass no longer having a use for him and bouncing. And honestly, like, don't you think that Dean has been in those situations before of people like using him and ditching him? But anyway, I digress. Today, we talked about how Dean has so much negative self-talk and fear of disappointing people that like he doesn't act surprised when the people he loves actually tell him the awful things that they think about him. And in the case of Lisa, It had to do with like his mental health and his emotional unavailability. And in the case of Cass, Dean basically filled in the blanks that Cass didn't need him anymore and that he was off to greener pastures, which we know is not true, but that's how Dean sees it. And his reaction to Cass, like leaving him is the same as his reaction to Lisa leaving him. And I don't think we talk about that enough in this fandom. Again, like just to reiterate that I like recently just put together the whole this is like a long distance relationship. Like they basically have like a I'm not going to say the words, but like are taking a break, basically. (laughs) Oh, this is heartbreaking. Thank you. I know. (laughs) It's so indicative of the way Dean sees himself to like that he feels undeserving of these things that. He accepts people leaving him because he feels like it's the right thing for them to be doing because he doesn't see himself as worth it. And then you literally even the way Cass talks about like, yes, I heard your prayers and didn't answer them because I had nothing to give you. It, It sounds like the I'm abandoning you, but it's more of the I knew I couldn't help. And there are so many things going on right now. It's like I have too much on my plate that I couldn't take the time to come tell you that I couldn't help you. Because Cass also sees himself. Like, he he believes that the only value he can bring is, like, his usefulness, right? We've talked about this before. And so if he can't be useful to Dean, then he is not valuable to Dean. Like, he, Cass feels like he doesn't deserve love just for being who he is. And Dean thinks that he just doesn't deserve love, period. Ugh. The, ugh. The, mm. Sorry. <laughs> just need to get out a bunch of frustrating groans there. The worst is I'm literally rewatching that 70s show, and this is literally a plot point that's occurring in the episodes I'm watching of two characters who like each other, but are too nervous to be around the other one. So they're just like not talking to each other and then just going away being like, oh, I want to be with him so much. Yeah, that's Dean and Cass. That's how I see it anyway. This week, we have a message from Chess, and before we listen to it, we would like to remind you to send us a three-minute voicemail. To respond to anything we discussed today, you can use the recording app on your phone and just email us a recording at carryingwayward at gmail.com. We also want to remind you that Drew and I are going to be answering the question, what are your thoughts on the use of Gabriel's Horn of Truth as a red herring in this episode for our Roadhouse supporters on our Impala Talk? Stay to the very end of the episode to hear a short clip. Hi there, my name is Chess and my pronouns are they, them. Um, I love listening to your podcast. I've been listening for a little bit. Finally, I'm all caught up and can listen to it weekly as it comes out. 
which is exciting. I love to be able to do that. Um, but I was listening to your recap of season five, episode nine, The Real Ghostbusters. And Mary's um, deliberation on how it feels like the creators present their fans was very spoke to me very much because I also agree that it feels like the creators present their fans and or the fan base that they got. And Mary brought up the whole of the convention, but I'm going to focus specifically on Becky because that is the most obvious resentment of the fans that they got, in my opinion, because Becky is herself an insert for what the creators think of the female fans. Um, She's obsessive. She wants the brothers to date. She's in love with one of them, et cetera, et cetera. All of these things that like are quintessential or were quintessential at the time to the female Supernatural fan. And Supernatural actively did not want those fans. They wanted the white bread, macho, 30-year-old man. But they got a bunch of teenage girls. And that resentment, I don't think, goes away. Allegedly, the series finale was changed and I won't give any spoilers on the series on the series finale, obviously, for Drew. Um, but the allegedly the finale was changed to give Jared a more a more prominent role because Walker was coming out. And Walker would have the fans that Supernatural wanted to have. Walker would have those 30-year-old macho, manly, white bread fans. And so they played to those fans that they don't have. Instead of the ones that they do, that did not want that series finale, that wanted a better finale. And I have described the final shot of Supernatural as looking straight to camera and giving the middle finger to your fans. Because that's what it feels like. And when I first started Supernatural, I was a teenage girl and I had to look at their portrayal of Becky and realize like, oh, that's what the creators of my favorite show think about me. They don't want me to be their fan. They want somebody else. Um, And it's just, it was just a really good insight uh, from Mary. And I just wanted to add on to that a little bit um, by bringing up specifically Becky and specifically the misogyny in Supernatural because God knows that there is a lot. Um, But thank you uh, for your podcast and listening to voicemails and i can't think of anything else to thank you for but you know, just thank you in general first may i just address all of our listeners and say you are all the people we want exactly listening to this show every one of you everything you are whether you are the 30 year old whitest of breads or any other thing on any other spectrum we're happy to have you and chess thank you so much for this voicemail Like, it's something I've heard repeated, like, before I joined this fandom, before I became a part of this, that there was always this level of, like, combativeness within the fandom because there was this, and I think now I'm seeing it more and I'm hearing it more, this almost, like, lack of respect for the fans that the show did bring together. And that, like, breaks my heart to imagine people who care so much for a thing And having the creators actively work against them almost. And again, I don't know how much of this is hearsay versus like recorded documented proof, but the feeling it is giving everybody, the the consensus I have come to understand from many other uh, followers of the show is that there definitely was a disconnect there. And it's it's super hard to see. And again, I think we talked about it again. I think Mary, I'll let you take it away, but like, the way they treat Becky in that episode and overall in the show up to this point is just, it's hurtful. Right. And, and Chess, thank you so much for uh, this really thoughtful voicemail. The thing with Becky is that we're going to see a complete destruction of her character in season seven within the span of one episode. And I, 
I'm very excited to get to that because this is something that I've been looking forward to discussing because I feel rage when I think about that episode, the decisions that are made with regards to her character. And then I feel the same palpable rage uh, when I think about what happens to her in season 15. I completely agree with you that this, this is, this is truly how the creators saw their uh, teen girls fan. Whenever we talk about teen girls being thrown to the wayside, I guess, I always think about a poem by Olivia Gatwood called When I Say We Are All Teen Girls. Uh, I would really encourage you to go listen to it on YouTube. It's it's truly beautiful and haunting. Uh, But I will read you just a quick excerpt because it speaks to that, like, to that rage that people feel, that anger towards teen girls. And of course, like given the work that I do in research, like I I tend to see a lot of that, a lot of the time that, that disgust, that dismissal and all that stuff. So, and of course there are the teen girls, the real teen girls huddled on the subway after school, limbs draped over each other's shoulders, bones knocking an awkward wind chime. And all of the commuters who plug in their headphones to mute the giggle, silence the gaggle and squeak, not knowing where they had learned to do this, to roll their eyes and turn up the music, not knowing where they had learned this palpable rage. And I I truly feel like this is something that we do see when it comes to Becky, because there is a hate towards her from the creators that is then leveraged from the audience. She is made into like a hateable character. I'm excited to get to that episode in season seven, because I certainly have some thoughts and we are going to dive deep into it and uh, invite some friends to talk about it with us. So thank you, Chess, for bringing that to our attention. Yeah, again, thank you for an amazing voicemail. And I truly hope I can say redemption for Becky. No, there will be no redemption for Becky. God damn it. (laughs) Yep, sorry about that. So Drew, what what reflection and call to action do you have this week? I, you know what? I feel like this episode, as much as I enjoyed it, and yes, I had my trouble with it that I've kind of overcome a little bit with your words of encouragement towards Sam's story. I really didn't connect with it all that much, except for like the really blunt, like kind of like take a moment to look at yourself in the mirror moment of like, there's a time and a place for honesty. And I think this episode does focus more on one side. And I think we kind of brought the other side into it a bit of how, like, I think you said it best. Sometimes you got to shut up and eat that meal, no matter how bad it tastes. Like, it's just... Just, you know what, sometimes, like, I I never want to say lie for the sake of helping somebody kind of thing. But, like, if it's not hurting anybody and it's purely there to encourage them and to make something better out of it, then a small fib is not the end of the world. But it is just knowing how far to push that. How often can you say, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, until you've gone too far that turning it around and going, well, actually... Does it then make you look the bad guy or the jerk or that you made the mistake by not being honest sooner? So the reflection here for myself is call to action is really just to like when I'm in those moments of being able to be truthful or fib a little bit, weighing it truly and deciding whether I'm am I doing it for the benefit of the other person or the benefit of myself? And you, what have you to reflect on or call to action this week? Well, so this episode made me feel called to it, like examine and and think about what I think of as truth, right? Because I literally just spent an entire semester not arguing with a professor per se, but like almost when it comes to like people speaking their truth. And this episode is sort of showing me a side of this conversation that I hadn't really considered, which is that like, quote unquote, our truth can also be contextual. And, And we've talked about that, where like some things that I feel very, very strongly in one moment may no longer be as strong a little bit later and are then going to be mitigated by my love for that other person, right? So again, taking the very specific example of like the sisters, for example, uh, and Lisa. So it's not always contextual, obviously, like sometimes when people hurt you, they hurt you and that needs to be said. Um, But sometimes like in this episode, we can speak our truth when we're under the influence of like anger or betrayal or, or, any of those things and end up saying things that like overall we don't necessarily mean. 
Um, so just, I guess, food for thought for me. And uh, maybe I owe my professor an email now. <laughs> You've been listening to Carrying Wayward, a supernatural podcast produced by Rochelle Castellano, hosted by Marie Figuereau and myself, Drew Schulman. Thanks to everyone supporting us on Coffee or Patreon. And an extra thank you to our Bunker patrons, Katira L. and Jeremiah Thomas. This week, we'd like to thank Chess for their message. You can find the links to all our social media and our merch store at carryingwayward.com. And don't forget to leave us a rating and a review wherever you listen to us, please, please, please. If you like Carrying Wayward and you'd like to support us in our project to go through all 15 seasons of Supernatural, you can support us through Coffee or Patreon, and you can find those links at CarryingWayward.com. Carry on our Wayward friends. We have such a good question this week. Uh, So what are your thoughts on the use of Gabriel's Horn of Truth as a red herring in this episode? I love it, though, because it really fooled me. Yeah, I thought it was really good. Like, it was a good way to get cast to be, like, there without necessarily being there, you know? Like, um... Yeah, it was an interesting choice. And, like, it actually makes me wonder, like, what is the next angel relic we are going to come across? Do we come across another one? Obviously, you can't answer that. But, like, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry. I, I need to cut you off because I, oh. I just thought of something with regards to cast that... So he's not human and therefore the curse may not have worked on him. However, I find it really revealing that Cass is not around when Dean can only get the truth. 